s'appelle Christopher Arthur, donc de l'Université de Sussex. Thank you. Um, my theme today is money. Karl Marx said of himself that no one had written so much on money but had so little of it. In the history of philosophy, the greatest minds have been aware that the existence and power of money poses a problem. One need only mention Aristotle. Of course, if one accepts that capital is a work of philosophy as much as of economics, then pride of place must go to Marx. Within economics proper, there has always been a split between those who dismiss money as a veil occluding the real economy and those who grasp that what is new about the modern world is the hegemony of monetary relations. Orthodox readings of Marx place him in the former camp, but he is better understood as recognizing the importance of money in shaping economic processes. However, here I do not enter into exegetical disputes. I present my own view of money. First, I argue against naturalism in value theory. I then argue that value arises out of the practice of exchange in such a manner that it exists only when the dialectic of commodity relations results in money. The main point of the paper is that the concept of money requires elucidation through drawing on the resources of Hegel's logic. This discussion is part of a broader project to provide a systematic dialectical reconstruction of the categories of Marx's capital, for which it serves as a test case. Systematic dialectic is a method of exhibiting the inner articulation of a given whole. Science, in treating such a totality, must take the shape of a system comprising a set of categories capturing the forms and relations constitutive of the totality. Hence, the presentation of the totality in thought is a systematic dialectic of categories. However, more is involved in my theory than method. Ontology is also at issue. Hegel's logic has two characteristics besides its systematicity. Number one, the forms of thought are said to be sufficiently autonomous to be self-moving. Two, the conceptual framework is therefore said to be the truth of reality. This is why he called himself an idealist. I believe the form of value has a similar ideality, but it is a real ideality which imposes itself on the content of economic life. The relevance of Hegel's logic to my reconstruction of Marx's categories flows from the reality of that practical abstraction in exchange predicated on the identification as values of heterogeneous commodities. The different goods concerned play the role of bearers of the new social determination. They become subject to the value form. So the value form of the commodity rests on a split between value as the identity of commodities premised on their equivalence in exchange and their material diversity, differentiating them from each other as use values. In my view, there is a significant parallel between the movement of exchange generating a practical abstraction from the natural specificity of commodities and the movement of thought generating a system of logical categories. In both, the self-moving forms impose themselves on the real material they address. 
As a result, it is possible to illustrate, to illuminate the forms of value with the categories of Hegel's logic. <coughs> My approach to critical political economy holds that determinant of economic categories is social form, not the natural basis of the economic metabolism. I reject the naturalistic approach that sees in labor, its allocation and its productivity, the natural determinations reflected in forms of social recognition, such as prices and profits. Instead, I see social practice constituting social forms, centrally the value form within which is inscribed productive activity. Following from this, value itself is not given prior to its forms, but rather it is constituted in and through the development of exchange relations. My value form approach to money holds that money is no veil of the real material content of economic relations. It is essential to value relations, not merely the shape in which an underlying matter is expressed. I argue that only money makes value actual. <clears throat> what is essential to commodities is not to be found in them through some reductive abstraction. It arises only in exchange relations and hence must be discovered in the relation of one commodity to another as determined in and through their outward forms, especially their relation to money. Because production units are dissociated one from another, labors become social only in so far as their products are exchanged. Although labor always naturally takes the form of concrete labor, which is as heterogeneous as commodities themselves, the consequence is that these labors are socially cognized in value only as abstract. In truth, the peculiar abstractness of the labor producing commodities is the result of the social reality of exchange, not its ground. Moreover, the process of exchange takes hold of many things that are not products. And insofar as it circulates products, these are given value forms, such as price, that do not make explicit their origins in production. In its immediacy, the commodity has a pure form. If naturalism were correct, then money would be no problem for theory. Since all commodities would be inherently valuable, including gold, then gold money would be merely a numeraire, a typical commodity in being a value, but special in its designated function as measure of the others and as medium of their circulation. However, it makes no sense to presuppose that a commodity in isolation has value. Value has a purely social reality. If, however, value is a socially constituted form, its concept cannot be glossed in the usual way, for example, by analogy with a natural feature of commodities, such as weight. Because of this, money has a peculiar role in ensuring that the actuality of value is posited in practice. The universal aspect of commodities is secured only insofar as it is posited through their common relation to a universal equivalent, namely money. One way of thinking about my proposal to make form central is by analogy with Kant's Copernican revolution, wherewith he made the objects conform to their cognition. In our case, the commodities must conform to how they are practically known through the forms of value. Instead of commodities being given as values and measured in money, money is what allows commodities to be known as values in the first place through transcendentally synthesizing the commodity manifold. 
Money is not simply the provision of a standard of comparison for commodities already inserted in the value dimension, it constitutes the value dimension. The monetary form is the condition of possibility of a unitary sphere of value relations. From the observation that all commodities are exchangeable, directly or indirectly, in definite proportions, arises the postulate that all the many exchange values possessed by a commodity share a unitary essence, an inherent power of exchange. The simplest form of value implicit in commodity relations is the value of A is expressed in B. I follow Marx in seeing the commodity in relative form, A, as the commodity whose value is manifested and the commodity in equivalent form, B, merely as the material shape of the value of A. Moreover, as Marx insightfully observes, B is present here as a natural body. It is not present as a value. It is not a value because there is not yet positive the presupposition that there is any such thing as value prior to this relation. Even if we assume this is a value relation, Value cannot be given in the natural body of either commodity. Hence, the heterogeneity of such bodies requires a form of value to abstract such features away. In this sense, value is what the commodity as a natural body is not. As Marx saw, if A cannot thus express its value in its own body, it yet posits the body of B as the locus of the value it must exclude from itself. Ideally, value is determined in opposition to the heterogeneity of use value. But value must appear if it is to have any actuality. Immediately, a commodity appears as a use value. But because the value of a commodity is defined in opposition to its own use value, it cannot appear there. However, in the form of exchange value, the value of A appears as the natural body of B. So there are here two worlds which predicate themselves on use value in inverted fashion. In essence, value is not use value of A, but as appearance, value is use value of B. The peculiarity of the equivalent form is that in it, the commodity's natural body counts not as itself, but as value. Money as the universal equivalent is likewise present as a natural body. But it achieves its status as the actuality of value only by virtue of the relations to commodities, unifying them in their common relation to what they are not. All commodities must exclude one commodity from the relative form in order to serve as a unique equivalent. The natural body of gold is equivalent to value as such, according to the commodities in relative form. However, this is not like pieces of iron counting as weight as such, because iron already has weight, hence serves as representative of the class of weighty things. But gold is not yet known to have a value, rather it is posited as all commodities value by them. In the case of gold money, it really is the case that gold is simply the shell of a social substance posited in the relations of commodities and money. Since value is not yet grounded, it is not possible to take gold as already value, hence a suitable measure for commodities. Gold can figure here only as it immediately appears, namely as a natural body. Its goldenness is not the utterance of its own value, but the outward manifestation of the commodity's value. Thus, money is the actuality of value in that it opposes itself to commodities as their universal equivalent by appearing in a commodity alongside them to which they can relate in exchange. In the first edition of Capital, Marx drew a very interesting analogy to make the strangeness of the relation between money and commodities clear. <coughs> it is as if, alongside an external to lions, rabbits, and all other actual animals, 
there existed also, in addition, the animal, the independent incarnation of the entire animal kingdom. This example is a reminiscence of Hegel's point as follows. Animal as such cannot be pointed out. Only a definite animal can be pointed at. The animal does not exist. On the contrary, this expression refers to the universal nature of single animals. And each existing animal is something that is much more concretely determinate, something particularized. But to be animal, the kind considered as the universal, pertains to the determinate animal and constitutes its determinate essentiality. If we were to deprive a dog of its animality, we could not say what it is. Things as such have a persisting inner nature as well as an outward existence. Now the peculiarity of gold money is that as the universal commodity, it can be pointed out. The universal aspect uniting commodities is presupposed to be value, and in money, this inner nature is posited as a thing beside them. Hegel rejects the analytic opposition between the universal as wholly abstract and the singular as concrete. His dialectical view is that the universal is no mere abstraction. It is a concrete universal that comprehends within itself its particularizations. Now, as we have just seen in the passage where Hegel discussed the animal, it is not the case that the concrete universal exists alongside the individuals. The universal is understood as the inner essence of the singulars, making them what they are. Why, with the concept of value, if this is to be considered as such a concrete universal, is it not found within the commodities, but outside them, incarnate in a money commodity that counts as their universal essence? It is because commodities as such are materially heterogeneous and share no inner nature. The generation of value as a concrete concept is secured only when money, as a material existent, gives commodities a universal form in price. While the universal thought forms comprehends particularizations in thought, the value form comprehends its particularizations through the objective relation in which such money stands to commodities. It follows there's a difference between applying Hegel's logic and my parallelism. In the first case, the hypothesis would be that there is a universal imminent to commodities which can be abstracted by thought. In contrast, I argue the movement of exchange models Hegel's concept in practice. This is why a material bearer of the universal moment is required alongside the singular commodities it comprehends as values. Hegel explicitly mocks the idea that the universal exists as a particular apart from its instantiations. He writes, the universal must be distinguished from the particular according to the proper determination. Taken formally and put side by side with the particular, the universal itself becomes something particular too. As if someone who wants fruit, for instance, were to reject cherries, pears, raisins, etc., because they are cherries, pears, raisins, but not fruit. However, in the case of value, just this situation obtains. Marx writes, though a commodity may, alongside its real shape, iron, for instance, possess an ideal value shape or an imagined gold shape in the form of its price, it cannot simultaneously be both real iron and real gold. The owner of the iron cannot go to the owner of some other commodity and refer him to the price of iron as proof that it is itself virtually money. The peculiar necessity for value as universal to appear in a form capable of interacting with commodities means it must take the shape of an analog of the animal, namely a locus of universality alongside the singulars. But since at first the only relation commodities have is to other commodities, a single commodity must be posited in this role. 
Money stands apart from commodities because only thus can their value be presented to them. In what follows, I explore the homology between the value categories and those of Hegel's logic. To illuminate the form of money, I shall draw on Hegel's doctrine of the concept. I begin with its initial sections that together make up the so-called subjective concept, the concept as such, the judgment, and the syllogism. The concept as such has three moments, universality, particularity, and singularity. Since the concept as such is purely formal, Hegel stresses that singularity is not to be taken to mean single things, singulars. The latter appear in judgments, we shall see, when the formal moments split into distinctly separate finite instances. Now an important subtlety flowing from the difference between singularity and the singular is that the movement of particularization is doubled. At the purely formal level, the concept particularizes itself to singularity. But at the level of reality, there are many identical singulars, each of them particularizations of the concept. According to Hegel, the singular maintains the exclusivity characteristic of determinate singleness. Yet, as the implicit instantiation of a universal, it is capable of reflecting it. This return into itself of the concept takes shape as judgment. The abstract paradigm of the judgment is the singular is the universal. The moment of particularity validates this judgment if the singular is in truth a determinate particularization of the universal. From this form, the concept passes into the syllogism. Hegel says this about the relation of the conceptual and the real. Everything is a concept, the existence of which is the differentiation of its moments in such a way that its universal nature gives itself outward reality through particularity, and in this way makes itself singular. Or conversely, the actual is a singular, which raises itself by means of particularity to universality and makes itself identical with itself. I now draw upon all this to articulate the form of value. Uh, as shown in the uh, table in the uh, photocopy. The value concept must be articulated formally as universality, particularity, singularity, as we know. We have also seen earlier that there must be a material bearer of the value concept alongside the commodities. This is money. Moreover, because amount is the only particularization of value logically possible, the singularity of the concept <laughs> is given as an amount of money. Recall this is the singularity of value, not a singular instance of value. But singular values are posited for us in the shape of commodities. This brings us to the judgment which in our material instantiation of Hegel's paradigm is this commodity is valuable. The determinate judgment how valuable can be expressed only in money. Thus the coat as a singular commodity is shown to be valuable in virtue of being equated to so much money. Both sides are required for the concept of value to realize itself. This means there are two particularizations of value. The commodity as priced is particularized ideally as a simple sum of value measured in money. But the commodity as material object is multiply particularized concretely in bodies of value. There are multiple similar coats of the same value. In the coat, commodity value exists consubstantially 
with use value. As if, like use value, it existed naturally in this material form. There are, as it were, bits of value in the world. As tied to a material shell, these values are numerically distinct and can be destroyed, both materially and through revolutions in market conditions. While money is the bearer of the pure concept of value, the real determinacy of value is given in judgments of worth. But for a commodity to be elevated to a value through such a judgment, money must meet it halfway by appearing in an empirically operational form. This requires a standard of price. Marx stresses there is a conceptual distinction between money as measure of value and money as standard of price. The former constitutes value as a measurable entity. The latter, on the presupposition that value is measurable, supplies a common standard for comparing values of commodities. At the level of the pure concept, money notionally grants dimensionality to value. At the level of finitude, commodities must be confronted with an operational standard of price in order to make judgments of worth possible. Money appears as a finite amount of itself that can be set equal to every commodity as if it were one among them, as if price were just a form of barter. Money as a piece of itself pretends to be something that has value rather than being the necessary form of value. In price, money acts as if it were just a numeraire, and the commodities act as if they were inherently valuable. But in truth, value achieves conceptual determinacy only through price. The table in the paper shows how these sides of value, money and commodities, interpenetrate. The double movement of particularization of value results in both the presence of money as an amount of itself and the presence of the single commodity, which in virtue of the parallel of particularization is posited as an amount of value. These moments are explicitly reflected against one another in the judgment of worth. We see that the determinations of the concept taken from Hegel are here present in this table. But the value concept is not inherent to a specific thing, like animality is to a dog. Rather, value as a concept presented in money appears to fall apart from its instantiations in material commodities. The mediation between money as the singularity of the concept and the commodity as a singular value is price. As for the syllogism, the only form relevant is that which Hegel calls the syllogism of equality. In our case, it is the inference that if the value of A equals the value of B, and the value of B equals the value of C, then the value of A equals the value of C. Since value is actual only in price, this implies the transitivity of prices. We have a consistent value space instead of a set of contingent prices, still less a mess of ad hoc barters. When judgments of worth coincide, they may result in an exchange. This move from the subjective conceptuality of value to its positing in real transactions corresponds to Hegel's logic of objectivity. If a sale is followed by a purchase, a new logic and a new function of money emerges. This is when I sell in order to buy. Exchanging a commodity for money and then exchanging the money for another commodity is the objective correlate of the concept of value just discussed. Having served its purpose as medium of circulation, money drops away, or does it? In fact, since every purchase is a sale, the mediator money stays always in circulation, albeit further and further removed from the original purchase. 
However, if this movement of money recoils back on itself in the circuit money, commodity, money, money makes itself origin and aim of its circuit. Buying in order to sell reverses the teleological positing of commodity, money, commodity. The mediator takes over from the extremes. Money now liberates itself from use value in setting the aim of exchange as valorization. Money has become idea in Hegel's terms because the system is now centered on itself. The self-reference of money in the circuit constitutes a new form of value, capital, which realizes itself through the metamorphoses of money and commodities. I have argued that the categories of Hegel's logic may be deployed in understanding capital because material practice has generated a model of Hegel's idea. However, the logical structure has to be supported by material relations. There is no given of which one forms a concept, namely the concept of value. Rather, value is a concept given to us from practice, having been generated behind our backs. Value is a concept objectively present to us in the circuit of capital. In short, value is a concept, hence not originally our concept. It is not through some externally applied method that the idea of capital is identified and defined. Capital defines its own identity through the circuit of the determinations of its concept that it itself presents. Thank you.